This episode of Sports Spectrum's podcast is presented by our new football show, Sports Spectrum's Weekly Slant. Y'all need to go check out this show. We had another new episode last night. It premieres every single Wednesday night, 8 p.m. Eastern, on our Facebook channel, our YouTube channel, and our website, sportsspectrum.com. There is no other show like this, a football show dedicated to faith, football and faith. Try finding another show out there that is just football and bringing Jesus into that football conversation. I can't find one. That's what makes this show, The Weekly Slant, so unique, and we hope you'll check it out. It's on our YouTube channel, it streams on our Facebook channel, and it's at our website, sportsspectrum.com. You can watch the latest episode or catch up on all the episodes right there at our website, sportsspectrum.com. The Weekly Slant. Tune in and check it out. Welcome to Sports Spectrum, where we bring Jesus back into the conversation. Here's your host, former ESPN producer, Jason Romano. Hey guys, welcome to the show. So excited for our guest today, Andy Irwin. He is a filmmaker, a movie producer, and a chief creative officer with Kingdom Studios with his brother, John. He's part of this filmmaking team, the Irwin Brothers. What's cool about Andy, we had him on the podcast last year. He actually began working in his career as a camera operator for ESPN. So there was a time when Andy and I were colleagues and we didn't even know each other, which was pretty cool. But then he went on and founded this production company with his brother, John, in 2002. He's made some incredible movies, October Baby, Mom's Night Out, Woodlawn. How about I Can Only Imagine, which is my favorite movie that they've made. And even more recently, the Jeremy Camp story, I Still Believe, which released in 2020. Now he's got two brand new projects coming out, one October 1st and then one on Christmas Day. I'm going to let him tell you all about it on our conversation. I cannot wait for you to hear Andy Irwin talk about the making of his new documentary coming out October 1st and a movie about a pro football Hall of Fame quarterback's life coming out on Christmas Day. This is Andy Irwin joining us here today on Sports Spectrum. Let's take a listen. Andy Irwin. What's up, buddy? Welcome back to Sports Spectrum. Hey, Jason. It's kind of like an ESPN reunion, man. Every so time we talk, it is, right? It's great. It's great. It's a lot of sports history on this call. So love uh, love what you're doing. Love the stories you're telling. And love uh, you helping us kind of get the word out on our stories. Absolutely. I appreciate you coming back on the show. I'm going to tell people, go look in the show notes. Go uh, click that link and listen to the first conversation that Andy and I had last year so you can learn about his journey He's a, a longtime film producer. He worked on movies like October Baby, Mom's Night Out, Woodlawn, I Can Only Imagine, I Still Believe. And then he was also an ESPN camera operator back in the day, too. But we're not going to spend a lot of time here, Andy, talking about our past and all that connection because you got two right. projects that I'm so excited about. The first comes out October 1st. It's a new documentary film called The Jesus Music. And I remember last year when you and I were talking, it was funny when we did our podcast, you might not remember this. You were literally on your way to sit down with Toby Mac and do an interview. And you didn't tell me what it was about necessarily. You're like, Hey, we're just talking with Toby. And now I see this Jesus music documentary and I'm like, Oh my gosh, this is fantastic. I got to watch a screening of it. I love kind of the history and the behind the scenes uh, and how things work and like sort of the evolution of things. And I'm a huge music fan. Right. Tell me about this project and why it was such a, an important project for you to want to get behind and do. Yeah, Jay, you know, it was, this one was probably the most personal uh, that we've gotten to do just because Christian music is really kind of what birthed our career. You know, uh, you know, Michael W. Smith took a chance on us as kids from Birmingham, Alabama and let us do our first music video. Amy Grant was short after that, as far as letting us do videos for her. Um, and, and then ultimately it led to I Can Only Imagine, which was our breakout hit. And so, you know, for us to kind of go back and look at kind of the origin of this music that we love, the importance of the music for me as a fan was a treat. I just got to travel around the country and, and get to sit down and have a three hour conversation with all of my heroes and um, everybody from 
Toby Mac to Kirk Franklin, you know, to, you know, did all the way down the list. It was, you know, Bill Gaither and Michael Sweet from Striper. It was just incredible. Um, kind of what, ha- what happened to kind of inspire us doing it. It wasn't something we kind of sought out to do, but when COVID shut everything down, we're sitting around like saying, okay, you know, all of our other movies got pushed. What can we create now that we can't create later? Mm. And somebody in the, um, uh, in, in our, in our creative team raised their hand and said, uh, Josh was like, uh, you know, nobody's ever looked at the origin of Christian music. Uh, and for the first time in history, all these artists are off the road at the exact same time. <laughs> and, right. and a lot of them are five miles from our front door. And so we reached out to Michael W. Smith and Amy Grant, and we just said, if we were going to do something like this, would you guys be interested? And they said, not only would we be interested, but we produce it with you. Wow. And so people didn't know this, but Amy was about to have open heart surgery. She was about a month away from that surgery. You know, it's been very public since then now that she's had it, but uh, nobody knew it at that time. We were one of, you know, probably half a dozen people that knew it. And uh, so we went over to her house and we actually set up a whole crew outside of her house and filmed it through the window of her house and had a two-way intercom set up between the rooms so that we could kind of protect her from COVID exposure and any of that type of stuff before mm-hmm. she had her surgery. And she gave one of the most raw and candid interviews I've ever heard a music artist give. And it just spread to everyone else that we connected with of saying, hey, if Amy's going to lead the way, like we'll do that too. And so we sat down with, you know, and the stories that we got about the origin of this music was just beyond fascinating. And uh, this idea of these trailblazers that didn't have a roadmap, that uh, didn't know where they fit, uh, and kind of formed, you know, this forged this path that didn't exist. And it was incredibly rebellious and incredibly romantic. And it kind of transformed it, but we, we interviewed about 100 artists. Mm-hmm. And uh, it transformed into this two hour doc that Lionsgate saw it. And they're like, let's put that in theaters. And we're like, oh, really? It, that, great. And so it kind of everything got rolling that direction. And it's a doc that a lot of filmmakers worked on to help us get it finished. Uh, but it's something I'm incredibly proud of. And it's our love letter to Christian music. Yeah, it's it's really well done. And, and for me, I didn't become a Christian really till I was 27. It was the early to mid 2000s. So I don't know. And I wasn't a listener of this type of music in the seventies and eighties and even the nineties. I'd heard of Michael W. Smith, my place in this world. I've heard of Amy Grant and the music that she had that made the pop charts in the early nineties, but I didn't know uh, at all really that there was this historical sort of background on this Christian music world that existed and I've heard stories about Striper and you know kind of what they were entering into this like hard rock sort of hair band era of the late 80s so it was a lot of fun for me to kind of learn uh, because I love Christian music now and I love a lot of the artists that were featured sort of at the end of the doc but I learned a ton I need to hear the story though how did you first get hooked up because you said they took a chance on you when you did one of their music videos i think it was michael w smith first but how did you even hook up with them and get connected with them originally way back in the day yeah you know uh when we were when we were getting started back when we were doing sports um we wanted to to to, to move towards film and music videos was kind of the most logical kind of way to do that yeah. and uh uh but every time we go to nashville we were from birmingham alabama every time we go to to, to Nashville and we'd knock on doors and say, hey, can we have a shot? They would kind of <laughs> politely close the door in our face, say, we don't really need any help from Birmingham. Right. And, uh, and so we got used to a lot of rejections. Um, and we were kind of just about to kind of give up on the whole thing. And then Mike W. Smith had a, an album coming out and he had a small song co- uh, that he had written for his uh, daughter called How to Say Goodbye. And it was uh, um, you know something he wrote for his daughter's wedding Mm -hmm. And it was really personal to him. He wanted to do a music video for it, uh, but they didn't have a budget at all uh, because it wasn't one that was going to be a radio single. And so his uh, uh, manager, Chaz Corzine, that we uh, interviewed in the doc, Chaz reached out to us and said, would you guys do this just almost like a, you know, small home video using pictures and we'll pay you this little tiny amount. And we said, yes, we'll do it. Absolutely. But if we were to go take a loan out, to pay for the rest of the video. Could we do it as a big music video? Hmm. And they're like, yeah. So we went and got a $10,000 loan. uh, (laughs) And, uh, and we paid to do the video and Smitty came down to Birmingham and these two kind of runny nose kids from Birmingham directing his music video. (laughs) And that video, it featured Rachel Hendricks from October baby. It was one of her first things on screen. 
and we made that video and it turned out fantastic uh and was like the the number one christian music video for about six months and then that led to us doing videos for amy grant casting crowns a bunch of others and then that led to rock music videos that that kind of was where we kind of uh really enjoyed doing some really big ones for bands like skillet we did a video called monster that's got about 350 million views on youtube so yeah. um so we that kind of led to a big career and then eventually we made the jump to film but man those were the fun days we just had so much fun we got kind of uh, as we got into it and got too busy we kind of got lazy with uh whenever you do a music video you write these treatments and it's just an idea like a one-page idea of this is what we're going to do and and towards the end we just kind of got good with our rock music videos of blowing things up so uh, for the last uh, treatment we wrote for Skillet, uh, for the, the song um, Hero, uh, we said, uh, the band, the, it, read, it read like this, it was one paragraph. It said, the band comes out, things blow up, uh, it starts to rain, it, more things blow up, it stops raining, everything blows up, the end. <laughs> and they, they saw it, they are like, yes! <laughs> so uh, we had a lot of fun, a lot of great memories. So going back to all these artists, a lot of which we had worked with, as music video directors, it was cool to kind of go back and hear their origin story. And I think even for, especially like, like you said, for people that didn't grow up in the music, there's something universally relatable about the doc yes. uh, from a standpoint of that question of where do I fit? Where does my voice fit? And kind of the origin of Christian music starting in the seventies with these people that were labeled freaks that were hippies that had burnt out on the, the sex, drugs and rock and roll uh, had kind of come out of that hate Asbury kind of the bottom falling out of society kind of moment where the hippie movement didn't deliver the free love that they thought it was burnout. And then they found this real true free love from Jesus and they got labeled Jesus freaks. Yeah. And then the church didn't know what to do with them. Uh, mainstream culture didn't know what to do with them. So they just started singing their music in this one church in California, Calvary Chapel took a chance on these kids and out of that birthed this radical movement of kind of rebellious music that featured blatant Jesus lyrics. <laughs> and uh, it was this kind of seismic event uh, that then kind of rippled out that became, you know, the music that we all love now. So the new documentary film, again, The Jesus Music is out, releases October 1st. Everybody needs to go see it. There's also a companion book that people can check out releasing yeah. October 5th, the Jesus Music book, which I'm really excited about too. Um, it's weird when I watch something like this, I put on my producer hat, which is a different producer hat than yours, but it's still yeah. content more. creation and kind of the mind goes, you know, in terms of, man, how did they make this? How did they get this done? And the access you had was, was just incredible. I have to imagine though, editing a project like this yeah. is so difficult because you have two hours to make a documentary, but you probably have 300 hours yep. of footage because you're talking to these people, like you said, for maybe two or three hours. I saw Mike Donahue recently at a conference in August and I said, hey, Mike, you know, do you know about this Jesus music project? He's like, yeah, they sat down, Andy and, and the guy sat down with me. And, and so I watched the documentary and I saw like, you know, a couple minutes of, of yep. maybe of, of Mike. And I thought, man, it's gotta be so hard with so yeah. much footage uh, you know, to think about the hours and hours of footage that didn't make the cut was, is that the hardest part? Just the editing and, and cutting down things like that? Yeah, absolutely. Cause everything's so precious. Yes, um, right. You know, we, 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 you know, your, your math is exactly right. We had about 300 hours of interviews. Wow. And, um, that's a lot. And so, because we wanted to get the comprehensive story because we went into this, not knowing what the, the product was going to be. We just said, we want to find the story and then figure out what there is in there. And so like when I, when I sat down with like Michael Tate from Newsboys, Tate sat down and we did the interview and, uh, and at the end of it, he came up and he was almost sweating. He was like, bro, you broke my rule, man. 20 minute interviews, man, 20 minute interviews. I only do 20 minute interviews. I was like, Mike, uh, uh, that first 20 minutes has been rehearsed for 20 years. I'm not interested in it. Right. And I said, it's the other two and a half hours that was the gold. Mm -hmm. And, and he's like, yeah, you got, you got stuff out of me that I haven't really talked about. And uh, same with Toby Mack, like the first 30 minutes, cause Toby and I knew each other, but we'd never done something this kind of personal. And uh, Toby, you know, the first 30 minutes was more of a sparring match where he was just kind of, you know, kind of just testing me. Like all of a sudden in the middle of the interview, he'd stop and be like, is that light where it's supposed to be? Or what's the, what's the camera angle? What are mm -hmm. we looking at here? 
Mm. And then about 30 minutes in, he was like, okay, I've never talked about this before. And he really let down his guard. He's like, okay, this is legit. Uh, and so with all that stuff, we really had to kind of narrow the focus of what is this. And so it was kind of a distance medley relay of a bunch of filmmakers, including, you know, more than just John and myself, uh, Michael Libby Smith's uh, son, Ryan, uh, was a producer on it. He helped. Uh, Brent McCorkle uh, did a, a lot of heavy lifting. He's an incredible filmmaker that we love. Hmm. Uh, so there was just a, a great team of people that kind of kind of kept, you know, chipping away at the statue until we had something that we were proud of. But really, we kind of just focused on these key figures to kind of help guide us through the history of Christian music. So Amy Grant, Michael W. Smith, Kirk Franklin, Toby Mac, uh, and then kind of handing that off and then we have these little nice vignettes that we go on uh, down memory lane with like Michael Sweet from uh, from Striper and Bill Gaither. Yeah. Um, and that leads to this kind of explosion of the worship movement. And we that one was magic because we got to sit down with every major worship artist over the past 20 years uh, and kind of hear their perspective. And then that gives birth to kind of this new generation with Lauren Daigle and for King and Country and Lecrae. Um, and then there was so many that we could only get one or two quotes in but everybody it's kind of a there's this harmony when everybody's singing this song together that makes it feel larger than life yeah. and so I, i'm really happy with where we landed uh and there's enough great material there for a whole nother documentary well it's it's really good i mean i got to watch it and i thank you for sending us a screener but i was thinking like as a guy in the podcast world and have been doing this now for five years, I'm like, take all that footage and make a Jesus music podcast, you know, to extend yep. off it. So who knows, but yeah, I would love to hear like two hours with Toby Mac and, right. and telling you the origin. That's amazing. And there was a lot of Toby Mac in the doc. I don't want people yep. to think that there wasn't, but I just think about, man, it's so hard to edit down to two hours from 300 hours. Like that's just right. an impossible Thing. Yeah. something's going to get left in the cutting yep. on the cutting room floor that you just can't you know you just can't help because you got to make this thing two hours yeah i mean there was there were several of those where just the story was fantastic but we couldn't fit it in the doc so right. like one of those was uh not only did we interview bill gaither who's been super influential not just in the southern gospel world but in christian rock yeah um sure. and so we interviewed him but we interviewed his wife, Gloria, and one of the stories she shared that we couldn't fit into the doc is that it said, Gloria, you're an incredibly accomplished songwriter. What's the most personal thing you've ever written? And this is a, a woman that's in her 80s and has been there, done that, seen everything. Yeah. And she said it was 1968. She's like, Bill and I were pregnant with our third kid and the world was falling apart. There was wow. riots, assassinations, uh, you know, protests over, you know, you know, everything. And just uh, in the middle of all that, she said, I had a panic attack. And I was like, Bill, how in the world can we bring another kid into this world? And he said, go write about it. And she said that night I got by myself and I wrote a song just for me to hold on to. And that was the night I wrote Because He Lives. Wow. And, you know, Because He Lives, I can face tomorrow. Yeah. And so I was just like chills, but it was so good, but it really was more predating kind of the Christian contemporary stuff. And it didn't really fit in this doc, but there was just moments like that, that. You just hold on to as an interviewer and you're like, that was a magic moment. And so our hopes with the Jesus music is that we can, you know, present this as kind of the definitive look over that. But then there's a whole idea of branching it out and maybe do a five part series or something like that. If it, mm. if it does well. So we're, we're thrilled uh, to tell this story. It was just, that's great. It was, it was a treat for me as a fan. Well, I love documentaries too. So it was really neat to kind of see this come together and knowing that you guys put it together. It's awesome. The Jesus Music documentary releases October 1st. Andy Irwin is our guest here on Sports Spectrum. And interestingly enough, as we're talking, I said, how you doing, buddy? Before we started, you're like, hey, I'm drinking out of a fire hose right now. And I realized, oh yeah, so you got the Jesus Music documentary. You also have a pretty awesome project, a major motion picture coming out on Christmas, American Underdog, which we touched on just a little bit last year. You had just announced, hey, we're doing a movie on Kurt Warner's life, the former NFL quarterback, Pro Football Hall of Fame quarterback. Well, here it is. I got right. to watch a very rough screener, I guess, of the movie that it hadn't been finished yet, but got to see a little bit of this movie. And my goodness, it's awesome, this Kurt Warner right. movie. You were just beginning work last year, as I said. How hard was it 
to make a movie like this? Because I'm remembering this is in the midst of COVID here. How hard was it to make this movie while COVID was going on? The, the struggle to make an American Underdog was by far the most difficult task that John and I have ever taken on. Hmm. Uh, uh, I, it was daunting. And, and it was the daily struggle to will it into existence was, was hard. And it was a team effort. So the fact that it got pulled off and even turned out halfway decent is an accomplishment. And the fact that it turned out to be potentially special is a God thing. Um, Cause we're in the middle of, you know, COVID and, and all the protocols there that we had to abide by. Uh, in addition to that, they, uh, we had to kind of condense our shooting schedule to accommodate some of those struggles. Uh, so about a month before we filmed, we had to chop it down from a 40 to 45 day shoot to a 30 day shoot, uh, which meant like, it, it's like running a marathon and a full sprint. And, uh, um, and then on top of that, we had the storm of the century come through, uh, the, 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 the Southwest, uh, in Oklahoma city where we were and, uh, dropped, you know, at one point that was, it was well below zero with the windshield. And so, um, right. filming in those conditions yeah. was insane, but that struggle to kind of, fight through it that underdog spirit i think is what infused the film with what makes it special because that struggle that kurt and his wife brenda really fought through to make it into the nfl after being out of college football for five years you know struggling uh you know working at a supermarket making ends meet and then playing arena football on the weekends i think that whole struggle we we sensed just a little taste of it for the 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 few months that we were you know, in Oklahoma City, putting it together. Um, and, uh, and so I think it turned out something special. And then the cast that assembled, I mean, come on, Zachary and, Levi, Andy, <laughs> yeah, Zachary Levi. So and we had a little mini Chuck reunion with Zachary Levi and Adam Baldwin. Yes. But uh, uh, Adam Baldwin plays his co college coach in this one. But uh, Coach Allen, but um, uh, they, uh, uh, you know, Zachary Le Levi had been a, a longtime friend but we were facetiming one day before we started casting and we were looking at a bunch of different names but zach was at the top of our list and we just i hadn't talked to him about it and so we're on this facetime thing talking about something else and he said what's this um what's this kurt warner movie i keep hearing my name pitched around on and i was like zach i wasn't gonna talk to you about it because i, I know your book for the next three years with shazam 2 and everything else that you're doing uh i wasn't even gonna mention it he's like well let me send me the script let me see what i think and so I sent him that script. He read it. And then at midnight, I got a text from him saying, let's do a football movie. Wow. And, and, and he was in. And like, he was destined for this role. He looks just like Kurt. He, he really worked, does. Yeah. He worked hard with the quarterback coach to get his, you know, his uh, footwork right and to get his throwing motion right. And, uh, and, then, um, and then we started casting out from there. And so the first call after that was I went out to Dennis Quaid and – John and I were like, you know, we'd work with him on Imagine. We love Dennis. So I sent him, I put together a little highlight reel of Dick Vermeil and uh, of all the, his famous quotes from like press conferences and his big speeches and all that type of stuff, sideline stuff that NFL films had done. And I put those little 45 minute highlight reel together and, and I sent it to Quaid and I said, I'll let you play whoever you want in this production, but I think it's special when an icon plays an icon. And he watched that highlight reel and he texted me back. He's like, I want to, I want Vermeil. Let's do it. And he came in and just embodied Dick Vermeil. And Coach Vermeil watched it for the first time uh, last week in Napa with his family, about 60 members of his friends and family. And he was in tears. He was like, Quaid, he said, he texted me, he said, Quaid is a much better Vermeil than I was. And, uh, and so that was cool. And then Anna Paquin, an Oscar winner playing Brenda brought the fire and the feistiness and really dedicated herself to understanding Brenda's faith uh, in a way that felt very honest. And she did her homework and uh, just really grounds the whole film. So uh, it was a treat. Like it's, I'm super proud of the film so much so that uh, uh, Lionsgate, the most coveted slot in our industry is July 4th and Christmas day. Those are yes. our Super Bowls. Yep. And you don't get those slots um, unless the film really promises to be special. And Lionsgate came back and they said, you know, this is a crazy idea, but we're going to do this as a Christmas Day release. And for anything interacting with faith, especially, we've never had that slot. Nobody's ever had that slot. 
So for them to put that vote of confidence behind the film showed how much it was testing and how much the people really thought it had potential to be special. So I'm excited. It's a great movie. It's, it's, it's a movie. It's funny, you know, the outside looking in from a sports perspective with this show, it's like, Hey, it's a movie about Kurt Warner and sports, but it's really not. I mean, you have great sports, yeah. um, you know, m moments in the movie, certainly when he's playing in the arena league, which I loved how yeah. detailed you guys were, by Did the way, know? with the arena league uniforms and jerseys with the Rams in the Super Bowl when they beat the Titans and, I loved how you recreated that, which to me is the fascinating part of the movie in terms of being a producer, but it's really a love story, like you said, of Kurt and Brenda and their journey, which I had known, but I think a lot of people don't realize, man, this was not just a, this was truly an underdog story when you think of Kurt, like there's, he had no business ever making it to the NFL, much less playing in the NFL, then much less going on to be a pro football hall of famer and a Super Bowl champion. It's, it's an incredible story. Yeah, it was cool, you know, and that's part of why they decided that they wanted a Christmas Day release, because you want something that appeals to the whole family. It's kind of a four-quadrant movie. It, it it appeals to male, female, young, and old. And so yes, does. those yep. are rare. Those are really, really rare. And the cool thing about it was when we did the initial test screening, they asked the audience, they said, you can only pick one. And so there's an audience of probably about 500 people. They said, you can only pick one. How many here feel like this is a, a really good sports movie? And about 50% of the audience hands went up. And they said, how many of you feel like it's a great love story? And the other 50% uh, hands went up. So it, it definitely appeals to both. You know, I think the sports delivers. I mean, I think we try to put you in the middle of the action in a way that I don't think anybody's seen football before, um, uh, especially once you see the final version that we're seeing now with all the, the, the animation and special effects done. The, but the thing that we really tried to hone in on is we asked Kurt and Brenda when we first interviewed him, what do you feel like your story is? And they said the, the relationship between us with each other and our son, Zach, who's blind. Yes. Like that's the story. And it's the struggle we had as a family where we all fought for each other, that that's what led to the success on the field. And so I, I don't think if Kurt had met the single mom, Brenda, and her two kids, um, I, I don't think that there would be a legendary Hall of Fame quarterback. Yeah. Uh, and you did really well in telling the story of Zach too. Like that's gotta be a tough one to cast yeah. and try to recreate. And that kid who played Zach in that movie was amazing. Yeah. Hay Hayden Zoller is fantastic. So this yeah. kid that plays Zach, um, uh, he's a young blind actor. Uh, I, I don't think he knows what uh, a huge moment it is for his community that he is portraying this role. But uh, to my knowledge, there's never been a, a, a kid as young as him. Uh, who is actually blind playing a role right. like this. And so, uh, uh, he, you know, he's kind of the first of, of his kind of actor and we really wanted to cast that authentically. And so we looked for an actor that, that legitimately was blind and, and Hayden is just, he just lights up everybody around him. He's just the purest soul, just a sweet kid. Um, and we had a great experience with him and just really great actor. Um, and so he plays young Zach and then, uh, you know, and then the relationship between Kurt and Brenda played by Zachary Levi and, and Anna Paquin was just fantastic. So I think, you know, the, the struggle behind the scenes, I think Brenda is, is every much uh, a protagonist as much as uh, Kurt is. And it's the, the challenge between the two of them as underdogs, this woman fighting for her kids and her family uh, that inspires uh, her husband to fight uh, uh, for his dreams uh is really just a special one yeah and so i think awesome. especially where everybody is right now and i think everybody feels like a bit of an underdog because of what we've all gone through over the past two years i think there's a perspective there that you know leads to everybody kind of saying if kurt can do that maybe i can too and um so much so that one of the everyman perspectives in the film is this kid marshall that works with kurt at the supermarket mm -hmm. and marshall is played by mckylan rowe who is my, our dear friend holly rowe's son Yes, and, uh, I saw Holly, that. Holly was my, um, uh, you know, sideline reporter for years at ESPN, a dear friend, so happy to see her back on uh, Saturday Night Prime on ABC. Yes. Uh, just just one of the best people in our business. And I, you know, McKylan, uh was a kid that grew up around us. And, uh, and Holly being a single mom related a lot to Kurt Warner's story. And, um, and uh, you know, with McKylan, uh, uh, he had just graduated from drama school and he just said, you know, I'd love, 
any opportunities. And I said, well, on this one, buddy, I'm going to give you a chance to win the role. I said, your family relationship gets you an audition, but talent gets you the job. That's and right. I said, you've got to be good. And so he auditioned and he was fantastic. So much so that we kind of expanded the character. And so, you know, he becomes kind of that every man perspective. That is the audience's window into if Kurt can do it, I can too. Yeah, and, it's the guy that Kurt, the guy that knew Kurt before Kurt became famous yeah. too, which is always, there's always those people in the yeah. world of these athletes or any of these yeah. people that become super famous, right? Right, right. And it was, it was just a fantastic to kind of, so I, I remember calling Holly and being like, the kid's got talent and he's in it. <laughs> Not only that, but the trailer drops uh, uh, really soon and uh, he made the trailer too. And so she was, she was crying. He was cheering. It was really cool. That's awesome. Yeah, we're going to have the trailer at sportspectrum.com. People can watch it on our Facebook page as well. And we're really excited because we're going to be doing a lot more, hopefully closer to the film with American Underdog and all of our platforms that Sports Spectrum has. It just makes sense with the audience that we have and the audience that is going to see American Underdog. It's going to make a lot of sense. So people, right now as you're listening, it's late September. Mark down Christmas Day, right? Because yeah. that's the movie, the American Underdog movie. And make sure right now, October 1st, you go see the Jesus Music documentary as well with the Irwin brothers producing and Andy Irwin here as our guest. Dude, this has been great. Thanks for being here. Thanks for uh, all that you've been uh doing so that we can consume this content and be encouraged and be inspired and just uh grateful for your friendship and i know we'll be talking again soon so thanks a lot thanks a lot jay you're the best i love having these conversations with you i love the history and thanks for helping us get the word out man great stuff there from andy irwin filmmaker movie producer the documentary again is called the jesus music documentary releasing october First, that is a Friday. You need to go check that out. It's in theaters. You can learn more about the movie at thejesusmusic.movie. Thejesusmusic.movie. That's the website, not .com, .movie. Thejesusmusic.movie. And they got this companion book coming out as well, October 5th, called The Jesus Music Book. I've watched this documentary. I'm telling you, if you love Christian music on any level, you're going to love watching this film october 1st the jesus music and then we got the new kurt warner movie with his wife brenda american underdog releasing christmas day and zachary levi could not be more perfect as the actor playing kurt warner in this new film again christmas day so we got a couple months the trailer is going to be out in just a few days here you'll see it on our website and our facebook page the new trailer american underdog and the film comes out christmas day 2021 mark that down on your calendars that's a movie during the christmas break that you're going to want to take the family to i promise you that american underdog andy Irwin is a producer on that film and he's a great dude appreciate him sharing all the stories that he shared i'm just fascinated by his role as a producer in making films it's so different than the things that i've produced i've produced television i've produced podcasting I produced digital content, I produced radio, but I've never produced films. And so listening to Andy kind of talk about that got my juices flowing a little bit too, but he's such a great dude and the work that he's doing is important. See, he's bringing faith into the conversation as well with the work he does. And I just love his heart for Christ, his heart to tell great stories and just appreciate Andy for being here today on Sports Spectrum. We appreciate you as well. Before we go, make sure you check out, like I mentioned at the top, our new football show, The Weekly Slant, every single Wednesday night, 8 p.m. Eastern, on our Facebook, YouTube channels, and our website, sportsspectrum.com. It's football. It's faith in Jesus. The conversation centers around those two things, and there is not another show like it out there. Again, you can stream on Wednesday nights or watch all of the shows right now at sportspectrum.com. Thanks for tuning in. We love you guys. We'll see you next time right here on the show. Have a great rest of your day. Stay safe, and we'll see you again soon.